Welcome to the number one source for information, news, and opinion on your Columbus Blue Jackets. This is CBJ in 30, presented by Telhio Credit Union. You can also find the audio version on the CBJ Radio SoundCloud page, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, Google Play Music, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Now here's your host, Bob McGilligan. Welcome to the second and final week of Blue Jackets training camp. I'm Bob McElligot, and this is a Monday Mailbag edition of CBJ and 30 presented by Telhio Credit Union. You know, speaking of Telhio Credit Union, they've been helping people for a long time. They've been putting people over profits since way back in 1934. Can you believe that? So why settle for a normal bank when you can have a credit union that will put you first? To find out more, go to telhio.org. So the Blue Jackets played their second and final scrimmage of camp last night at nationwide arena it was pretty good uh, i think it was six four at the end of two periods and to me two periods is really all that counts because the third period is made up of all special teams play power play penalty kill three on three it finished with a shootout for crying out loud last night but uh there were some really good bright spots in that game oliver bjorkstrand had a couple of uh, goals uh mikhail gregorenko had his best showing of this camp to this point So a lot of positive things coming out of it. Uh, A lot of good looks. The biggest difference between the scrimmage on Wednesday and the scrimmage last night was the way that the lines were changed up by John Tortorella. And I thought earlier in the week that this was done because a whole bunch of players uh, were held out one day because of COVID concerns. But Alexander Texier, who was playing on the top line with Pierre-Luc Dubois and Oliver Bjorkstrand, was removed from that line during practice this week, and he was put as a centerman between Liam Foody and Emil Bemstrom. And he played in that same position during that scrimmage game last night. Mikhail Gregorenko, who previously was on a line with Miko Koivu and Boone Jenner, was moved to the left wing on the top line. And it worked out. It worked out pretty well, quite frankly. And I'll, I'll save a little bit of that for some of the questions that I have, but that was uh, the biggest change. Oh, and Riley Nash, who's been playing center, was moved to a wing position. He was playing with Miko Koivu. Um, I will not lie to you. I was not thrilled about some of those lines. I mean, you know, Jenner, Nash, Koivu. Yeah, a lot of good veteran experience there, but, you know, a lot of guys that play the same kind of game, not a lot of speed on that line either. And the Texier line that I mentioned with Foodie and Bemstrom on either side, I just don't like those lines that are made up of three young players like that. I just think it's a recipe for disaster in some ways, especially early in the season, especially in a season where you don't have a lot of time to get acclimated. And again, I don't know if there's any prayer of that line ever being intact during the regular season. I have no idea, but It's just like, I think there's enough experience around. They could put some experience around those guys. And again, you can put Texier right back up on that top line, but Grigorenko was making a bid for that spot in the scrimmage game last night. So, so many things to happen. And we don't know what's going to happen before it's all said and done, quite frankly. So we'll just sit back and wait. Today is an off day. Nothing today. And then back at it Tuesday, Wednesday, after practice Wednesday, the team will leave to go to Nashville and the season opens on Thursday against the Predators. All right. So that is the schedule in a nutshell. What other news was there this week? Michael Delzato signed a one-year two-way contract on Sunday, early Sunday. Um, So that's, I was going to say that's interesting. It's really not. It's not a surprise to me. We were sitting at practice on Saturday discussing all of this. Uh, I was asking Jean-Luc Grandpierre, when do you think this guy's getting a deal? I mean, don't you think he's going to be on the team? And he agreed. We all thought he was going to be on the team. And now he's on the team. How they handle him, how they utilize him, thats uh, those are two other very good questions before all is said and done. And so with those good questions uh, in mind, I am just going to go to your questions. Now, you have either... Uh, sent them to me via Twitter at Bobby Mac Sports, or or maybe you recorded a voice memo or a video and emailed that to me at bobbymac at bluejackets.com. 
And just so you know, from now on, you can do that either way. You can do that anytime you want to. All right. Okay. Let's get to this. Uh, let me get to your questions without further ado. And uh, the very first one is from Barrick Nichols. And Barrick says, who has been the biggest surprise so far? Barrick, this is a tough question to answer this year because I don't look at this as a regular training camp. As a matter of fact, yesterday when we were talking, I made the comment that watching this training camp has been just like watching regular season practices. Uh, you know who the players are, and I mean literally who the players are here. But you have a good idea who's going to be on the team. You know the roles that they are going to hold on the team. This isn't one of those training camps where you're looking for somebody to jump out. I, I mean, a little bit you are, but for the most part, even the guys that have been around, uh, the Nathan Gerbys, the Kevin Stenlins, you know, not only have they been around, but they've played a good chunk of NHL time now. So you're not really looking at them in the same way as if to say, man, what a surprise. That guy was unbelievable. I really liked what he did. And I, I think that he should be in the, you know, the top 12 forwards here. I think everyone's realistic. You know what people's roles are on this team. So to me, there really haven't been many surprises in this camp. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the Gregorenko addition. That's a guy we haven't seen. We haven't seen Delzato before, but other than that, you're not, you know, there are some guys that are going to wind up in Cleveland, no doubt. You know, the Jake Christensen, he was signed out of the Western Hockey League. You know, he's looked okay, but he's he's going to be an AHL guy, right? Uh, the Bay Ruther kid that came in from the Dallas organization. He's a depth guy. I know where he's going to wind up. You know where he's going to wind up. We all know where he's going to wind up. So, again, that, when you ask about surprises – in any other year, I think there is a little bit more uncertainty. I think this team, where it is right now, uh, the way that it is structured, the way that they play, the people that they have signed, I think we pretty much know what's going to happen here. So to me, there's not a lot of surprises. It's not like a normal year. It's, it's you know, I've been impressed with the way that some guys have played. Like Kevin Stenland, for instance. I really liked what he has done. I would probably be disappointed at this juncture if he doesn't get some time early on if they don't find a way to work him into the lineup he's had a very good camp i think uh you look at the game last night he made a beautiful pass to oliver bjorkstrand uh he also won a face-off clean that nathan gerby took a one-timer uh, right off the face-off and put in the back of the net so you know i i think he's had a strong camp his case was made more last year when he was here playing a regular role than what he's doing in this camp this camp for Kevin Stenland says, look, what you saw last year is what I am. It's who I am. It's what I do. And he's backing that up. So it's not as much of a surprise to me because I've seen him play so much over the course of the past, not quite two years, but he was in at the end of the year uh, prior to last. So anyway, I hope you understand what I'm saying here. And, and I'm not trying to downplay your question, Barrett, because normally in a training camp, you're right. But I think if you're a team that's going to compete, if you're a team that thinks that you're going to get into the playoffs and you have a chance to compete for the Stanley Cup, you don't want to go into every single training camp looking for this big surprise. I think that as a fan of this franchise for too long, you were looking for that next surprise of development camp, that next surprise of training camp, uh, that next guy that might be something that we didn't even think of or that nobody ever heard of or whatever it is. It's not like that anymore. It's not like that right now. It's not like that with this team. We know it is here. They know what is here. They know what they have to do. And if they want to play, they've got to do it. Simple as that. So for me, there's not really been that surprise that we normally see in training camps. Uh, a couple of uh, things here on Michael Delzato. Mark Carell II says, more often than not, a pro tryout doesn't result in a contract for the player. First of all, Mark, I, I don't 100% agree with you on that, but I'll continue. More often than not, a pro tryout doesn't result in a contract for the player. Is the Delzato signing surprising, or was this the expected outcome given his history with torts? I think it's twofold. The history with torts is a big part of it, Yes. But this is a guy who has been an offensive-minded defenseman in his career. The Blue Jackets lost depth 
on defense when Marcus Nudavara was shipped out and Ryan Murray was shipped out. I think this is a player that they wanted to bring into camp to look at. He's 30 years old, not old in life, but old in hockey life now. Bring him in, see how he fits in, see what he does. He played for John Tortorella way back when he was 19 years old for the New York Rangers. And he was a different guy then than he is now. Torch has told the story. They've stayed in touch. They used to have their battles when he was younger, Delzato, that is. Well, both. <laughs> they had their battles. Um, you know, they move on. Delzato's bounced around the league with some other teams, but they've stayed in touch. John Tortorella knows what he has in Michael Delzato. Michael Delzato knows what he has in a coach with John Tortorella. And the Blue Jackets have somebody else that can move the puck nicely off the blue line. Saw it last night in the scrimmage. Emil Bemstrom gets a goal because Delzato gets the puck at the right point and just threads a beautiful pass right off the stick of Bemstrom, who's got the stick on the ice, ready to redirect it, and he gets the goal. That's what Michael Delzato does, okay? And he signs a two-way contract, which gives you a little bit of protection there uh, when it comes to salary and, and all that stuff. So, um, again, I, I don't think – I know we've seen a lot of players come in on tryouts and then nothing happens out of it. But this year is different in many ways. I think if you're coming in <clears> – <throat> excuse me. I think if you're coming in on a tryout, there's a good chance you're going to get a gig, especially a guy like Del Zotto in this situation with what he does and with the Blue Jackets lost. But um, yeah, it's, it's not a surprise to me. Like I said yesterday, I was saying, when's this going to get done? Like to me, this is a no brainer. Are, are you, let me put it to you this way. Are you comfortable? If you take Del Zotto out of the mix, okay. And you're, you're defenseman. Let's go through it here. Jones, Wierenski, Savard, Gavrikov, Kukin peak those there's six now whatever whether those are these six or not is not relevant right now okay then you've got Scott Harrington you got Adam Clendenning who's here Gabriel Carlson so now there's nine but once you get beyond the six how comfortable are you with seven eight and nine can you improve over the seven eight and nine can you find something the seven, eight, and nine don't bring to the table? Like that offense I was talking about. So again, that's why to me it's it's a no-brainer. I think once you put everything together on it, it made a lot of sense. I'm glad they did it. I think they needed to do it. I think another veteran player around who's been in winning organizations around the league, I think that's valuable. So no, I'm not surprised. I, I like the move. And then you look where he's been playing the last couple of days. He's been playing but with Andrew Peak. So are we to believe that Dean Kukin is bumped out of the sixth spot going into Thursday's season opener in Nashville? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But for a team whose coach has already said he's going to loosen it up a little bit and try to score more, for a team that has trouble scoring and that's being polite, why not find another guy that brings offense? I mean, let's look at the facts. Your top pair, you're going to get offense from. Wierenski had 20 goals last year. Jones, I think offensively was down from previous years, but, you know, he he puts points up, okay? You know you're getting production offensively from that defensive pairing. Savard and Gavrikov, you're not expecting it. They're a shutdown pair. Keep the other team from scoring, rough them up, job done. Although last night, Gavrikov had a heck of a goal in that scrimmage. And as Jean-Luc Grandpierre said to me as we were sitting in the stands, he goes, you got to watch that guy. He's sneaky. And he's right. He is sneaky. Sneaky in a good way. I like that. Um, so then if you have a third line, and you've got Peek, who's a rookie, all right? If he's playing, he's a rookie. Uh, you've got Kukin, who moves the puck well, but doesn't score a ton of goals. If you can get a guy on that third pair that could bring some scoring, it's a plus plus, right? So that's where that stands. Jason R says, I like the signing of MDZ, Michael Delzato, of course. But will there be a risk of losing him with the two-way contract with waivers if he is playing well? There's conflicting things on how this works with the taxi squad. Um I I'm going to be totally honest with you. I'm, I'm going to break this down here in a minute for you. The taxi squad thing. Um, 
yeah, it, it confuses me a little bit. So before I get to that, Jason, let me go to Benjamin Krantz's question. Can you explain how the taxi squad will work this season and do they travel with the team? If so, do they still take warm-ups or do they just take the morning skates? All right, here's uh, the rules via the NHL um, as far as the roster. Each team will play with a 23-man roster under an $81.5 million salary cap. 23-man roster is what the teams have had, okay? That's normal business, 23-man roster. Each team will also be allowed to carry between four and six additional players that will travel and practice with the team as an additional precaution against lineup spots that could be vacated by COVID-19 protocols. Did you understand all that? Because if you didn't, I can put it into layman's terms for you. You're going to be able to take extra players along in case somebody gets tested positive. All right? So you're not going to be left hung out to dry. Now let's get into this just a little bit more with this taxi squad before I give you my best guesstimates here. Okay? Uh, again, minimum of four players, maximum of six. Waivers are required for players who would require waivers to be loaned to the minors. Okay? So – if you would normally have to go through waivers to go to the American Hockey League, even though you're going to be in the same building and around the same players and blah, 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 you'd have to clear waivers to go onto the taxi squad. So Jason's question, could that present a problem with Michael Delzato? Maybe, but I'll explain to you more in a minute why I'm not worried about it. There are a number of reasons I'm not worried about it. Um, let's see. Recalls for NHL games must occur before 5 p.m. Okay. One goalie is required on the taxi squad for teams with less than three goalies on the active roster, and that one goalie must be available for all home and away games in that situation. Okay. Last day of training camp, excuse me, last day of training camp is the first day players can be loaned to the taxi squad. The taxi squad dissolves when the season ends. Uh, taxi squad members can practice with the NHL team. They can join team activities. They can travel with the team, although that is not required. So you could technically go on a road trip and you don't have to take them except for a goalie. If you only have two on your roster, you have to take him. Um, taxi members, taxi squad members cannot practice or join activities other than those with the NHL team, meaning they can't go practice with Cleveland. If they're on the taxi squad, you can't leave them home from a trip to Detroit and send them up to Cleveland to practice with the monsters. You cannot do that. Not allowed. Um, let's see here. If a taxi squad player is deemed fit, unfit to play due to injury, illness, COVID, whatever, uh, the team can request they do not count toward the six player limit. So you could bring in somebody else if you wanted to. Uh, the cap hit, the effect on the team's cap hit while the taxi, while on taxi squad is the equivalent to if the player were playing in the minors. So if uh, you're making $75,000 to play in the AHL and $150,000 playing the NHL, if you're on the taxi squad, even though you're in the NHL, you're making $75,000. Injuries. Players injured on the taxi squad are assumed to have been injured while in the minor leagues. That's big for teams. That's the salary you pay while they're injured. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. Okay, so there you have it. So that's from Cap Friendly, by the way, if you want to go look that up and, and look at anything else that I said. Okay, so you get a 23-man roster. Now, I'm just going to go to last night's lineups here, and I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to count. You're going to count along with me on the players. 23-man roster. Seth Jones, yes. Scott Harrington, yes. Adam Clendenning, uh, I'm not counting him. Zach Waranski's, yes. Um, I'm going to put Delzato on there. Dubois, Foodie, Nash, Bjorkstrand, Texier, Bemstrom. So I've got 10 right now. Uh, Peak, Koivu, Atkinson, Domi, Grigorenko, I'm up to 15. Jenner, Gavrikov, Kukin. Savard, Felino, I'm at 20, and I've got two goaltenders, is 22. Okay, so you see what I did there? I've already got eight defensemen, right? I've got Jones, Wierenski, Savard, Gavrikov, uh, Kukin, Peak, Delzato, Harrington. I've got eight defensemen. 
So you're pretty good right there. Now that's, I'm not even counting a taxi squad yet. Okay. So what is it? Minimum of four on a taxi squad. So here's my guess. Simply a guess here. Uh, my four, and actually I was only a 22. I wasn't even a 23. So there's a little bit of room to play with here, but Stenland, Gerby, Robinson, and Kiv Lennox. That's four for a taxi squad. So I'm, I'm missing, I'm probably missing a guy somewhere along the way here, um, wherever that may be. But see, I think that's how you make it work. I think that's, I think it, it goes something like that. So I'm not worried about Del Zotto. There is no guarantee Del Zotto is ever going to touch waivers. You know, I mean, look at Scott Harrington. Scott Harrington is here. Um, well, I, I don't want to make it sound like he's only here because of this, but Scott Harrington is a guy that they didn't want to put through waivers for years because they were afraid that they would lose him. So look, Delzato, he didn't have a job until late. Nobody else was signing him. Doesn't mean that somebody wouldn't go after him if they had a need, but a lot of times guys like that sneak through the waivers anyway. Somebody would have to have a need and, and feel that he fit that need for it to be a problem. So that was a very, very, very long answer to Jason's question. I understand that, but I wanted to try to paint the whole picture for you. And I don't know if I did because I'm still confused on some of it. You know, you know how I am. I, I, I hate this kind of stuff. I, you know, the, the roster manipulation, the salary cap, the, all that jazz. That's not my forte. My forte is give me 20 guys. And I'll tell you who should play. Actually, give me 23 guys, and I'll tell you who should play based on how well they're playing and what they're good at, okay? More of a coach mentality. I'm not saying I'm a coach. I'm just saying I have that mentality. I don't – all this other stuff is – it confuses me. It it, it, it just um, – you know, I get so wrapped up in it. I, I just don't like it as much. Just don't like it as much. I like the whole – Give me a group. Let me put them into place and let them play. That's all. Uh, let me see here. Lucas says, it says where? I think it's supposed to say what? What are you expecting from Mikhail Gregorenko this season? I'm going to answer this very honestly. Not much. And before you take that as though I'm ripping on this guy, and that I don't have any belief that he's going to be a contributor. It's not what I'm saying at all. I just don't have much expectation because I don't know what to expect. Here's a guy that was a former first round pick of the Buffalo Sabres. He then went on to play with the Colorado Avalanche. And after stints with those two teams, he went back to the KHL for four years. Now he wants to be back in the NHL. He wants to be in the best league in the world. How can you blame him? He thinks he can play here. He thinks he can play better than he did in his two previous stints. Okay. Just show me. Just show me. I know the team has expectations of him because I've interviewed Yarmo. He's talked about him. I interviewed Torts. He's talked about him a lot. So they have expectations. What are my expectations? I don't have any. He doesn't have to impress me. If he impresses me, we're all going to be happy. Okay. And I'll tell you what, in the scrimmage last night, I was impressed. He had two points. The goal that he had was sick. Dubois gave him the puck on the goal line. I mean, on the goal line, almost below the goal. And he got it by Corpus Allo's skate, or he banked it off the skate, whatever it was. The angle I was at, I couldn't tell. But it was a heck of a goal. And as I said before, they had him as a third line wing with Jenner and Koivu. Now, the last couple of days, he's been on the top line with Dubois and Bjorkstrand. All right. I hope he does well. But your question wasn't, do you hope he does well? No. Your question was, what are your expectations of him? I don't have any. I want to see him. I want him to show me. Create my expectations, Mikhail. Create them. And I'll tell you something. Last week I sat here and I went into the whole Pierre-Luc Dubois saga and him signing the contract and the word that he wants to, you know, go somewhere else when it's all said and done and all that stuff. 
Jody Shelley and I talked on the Inside Edge about um, Domi wanting to be a number one center, perhaps, and that creating competition for Pierre-Luc Dubois. Remember all that? I'll tell you what, if he sees that as competition, it's working because he has been outstanding in the two scrimmage games, and they're just scrimmage. I get it. He's not playing the Nashville Predators. I get it. But, man, has he been good. He has looked strong. John LeGrandpierre says to me last night, there's the Dubois line, and then there's everybody else. And that's pretty much how it was. As far as Max Domi, you know, he's he'll break out. We're going to see him. He's trying to figure out. I think he's trying to, you know, get a feel for his teammates and game conditions and, you know, all kind of stuff. He'll be fine. Well, what are my expectations for him? To be terrific. That's what they are. But um, Pierre-Luc Dubois look really good. Really good in these couple scrimmage games. I hope he looks really good in a couple games against Nashville and a couple more against Detroit and a couple more against Tampa. I think that we open against Tampa, right? I went through this the other day with our, uh, our game ops director. Derek and I were talking on Saturday. We were talking about the, the home opener. I said, who we play? I don't, that sounds stupid. I don't even know who we play. I know the first four games. Ridiculous, right? It's the kind of world it is right now. And the good news is if I can figure out one opponent, I get the next two games right, the way this schedule's set up, for the most part. Oh, another question here. Who do I have a question from? Dennis Kelly. I've got a question from Dennis. In fact, I know I have a question because here's how he starts it. Yeah, I have a question. Now that I'm back in Columbus, kicking and screaming, can I buy you a cup of coffee if I run into you sometime? Dennis. 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 <laughs> you need to ask me that. Of course you can. Or maybe I'll buy you one. It's good to hear from you. And kicking or screaming or not, glad you're back. I'm glad you're back. But yeah, yeah, that we we would. Uh, I'm sure that would be fun. I I think we would. Uh, I think we would enjoy that uh, conversation over that cup. I'm very sure of that. All right, I've got one more question here. And don't forget, you can send your questions to me anytime on Twitter at Bobby Mac Sports via email, Bobby Mac, B O B B Y M A C at bluejackets.com. And you can also do that, those as a, a voice memo. You can record a voice memo on your phone, or you can uh, do it as a, um, a video, record a video too. And that's exactly what my buddy Greg has done. So I want to bring this one to you for the final question of the day on this Monday mailbag edition of CBJ and 30 presented by Tell Ohio Credit Union. Hi, Bob. This is Greg in Cleveland. Uh, I wanted to know, what did you think about the new alternate jerseys? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I do have a real question for you. Uh, I was on a recent show you did uh, with Jody Shelley, and I think it might have been Jody that brought this up. You guys were talking about Nick Foligno. And he brought up the numerous duties that a captain has on the ice. And I've only ever played in beer league, so I have no exposure to that. We didn't have captains. We certainly didn't have a coach. So I was just wondering, what were those responsibilities that a captain does have? Well, Greg, thank you very much. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to tell you something here, though. You make that uh, joke about what do I think of the new um uh, what do they call it? Color jerseys, whatever they are, the, the retro reverse retro, whatever the technical term is. Anyway. And, and that question is, if you missed this weeks ago, I kind of went off on it because people were, I, I thought people were too worried too much about the thing and what it looked like and all that. And I said, as part of my little rant, I said that, um, that my 19 year old saw it and right away he asked if he could get it. So to me, that's all you need to know. If that, you know, if, if that age group is into it, then good. Right. 
and he got one for Christmas. All right. I mean, he asked for one, he got one. So what do I think of it? And I watch him wear it around and I, I think I, I think I thought what I told you, thought it was fine. I wasn't, I didn't care what uh, patches were on the shoulders or anything. Kind of like the old logo once again. It was different with the red background. So even though you're just trying to get me fired up, Greg, nice try. Maybe you are a little bit. But one of those did appear in my house. So there you go. Why don't you, all right. Anyway, your question. What does a captain do? What does a captain do? By the way, if you're... If you're watching this on our Blue Jackets YouTube channel or Facebook or whatever you're watching it on, I've got to apologize. I'm still trying to break myself in. I changed my setup a little bit here, and I I moved the position of the camera a little bit, and I I keep looking I keep looking where it was, and I'm not looking at it, which is terrible TV etiquette. So I apologize. I got to get better with that. Remember, it's not where it used to be. There's something else there, and I'm looking at something else and that's why if, if you're watching this and you keep saying, why does he keep looking off the screen like he's staring into space? I essentially am because that's where, that's where I was looking for months and months. And now, I'm... anyway, if you're just listening to this, you didn't need to know that, but I'm going to tell you anyway, obviously. Um, anyway, let's uh, get to Greg's question. The captain, what does the captain have to do on the ice? It, it's not so much on the ice, Greg. And I'm sure that's not what Jody was talking about. Um, I don't know if you heard it differently or if you said on the ice when you meant to say off the ice. doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you this. Obviously, the guys that have letters on, uh, when there's a discrepancy, those are the guys that are supposed to be talking to the officials on the ice. Not to say no one else ever does, because they do. Especially older guys, they do it all the time. You think if Miko Koivu doesn't have a letter on his jersey as a blue jacket, that he can't go to some referee that he's known for the past 12 years and asked him why a call was made or not made of course he can but those are the guys that are supposed to talk to the officials okay but for the captain it's what he does off the ice it's all of the i I was going to say the unwritten responsibilities but i'll bet you they are written somewhere maybe with some teams maybe not but you are the liaison between the head coach and your teammates. So you're that guy that if there's a team issue and there's going to be a question of the coach, you're the guy that has to take the question into the coach's office. Depending on the coach, that job is easier in some places and tougher in other places. So that's it. Anything that's going on with a teammate. Um, Let's say there's friction between teammates and it gets to the point where it's uh affecting the overall team play it's your job to take care of it you've got to get in there you've got to talk to guys you got to straighten it out what about uh if a guy's slacking you know he's not doing um you know what he should be doing on the ice practice game doesn't matter you have to address that that's your job as a captain now here's where it's tough let's say you're struggling at the same time as long as you're trying, as long as you're putting the effort in, you can still have that talk. But, you know, sometimes sometimes it can be du- tough. You know, well, you haven't scored a goal in 10 games. What are you talking to me about? But you've got to police all these things. Travel. You know, Blue Jackets, a lot of times we stay after a game, depending upon the location. We go out west, we'll stay after the game, we'll fly back the next day. Let's just say for some reason – the team would want to come back after the game. Players would rather come back after the game, be with their families, whatever. If the travel schedule is already made, as a captain, you're going in and you're talking to the coach. You're lobbying for that change. And maybe it's the other way around. They're planning on coming home. You want to stay. Maybe you want that extra night where you're going to have a team dinner, which, oh, by the way, there, there's another thing. Put that together. You're responsible for all that. So you're managing a lot of things right? You're, you're not the boss, but you're, you're the, um, I don't know what's, I, I think it's a combination kind of, of uh, a cruise director 
and a mentor and a counselor, all that stuff rolled into one. So Greg, that's what the thing is with a captain. There's so much responsibility off the ice. And then you've got to take care of your play on the ice. And it's tough to balance sometimes. And that's why some are good at it and some are not. Some guys are leaders. Some people are leaders and some are not. You know, some people think they're leaders and they are not. And in hockey, you can tell pretty quick. You can tell by the way the team acts. John Tortorella talks about this all the time with Nick Felino. He has said numerous, numerous times when he came here, he didn't think Nick was ready to be a captain. And I wonder how close he came to replacing Nick as a captain. And I'll bet you he thought about it, but he never did it. And Nick has grown into that role. We all know how great Nick Felino is. We know how personable he is. But just think of all those other things I talked about. You know, everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants other people to have favorable opinions of them. And as a captain, sometimes you can be the good guy, but sometimes you've got to be the bad guy. Sometimes you just have to tell people what they do not want to hear. I think I'm good at that. Sometimes. No. But, but you understand what I'm saying. I'm just saying there's, you know, some people are good at that stuff and some people falter under the pressure. I think you look around in this game, it, there have been people, look, there have been captains that have been captains uh, because they were the best player on the team or they were the oldest player on the team. Sometimes they're just guys that are in a role they shouldn't be in. Sometimes they grow into that. John Tortorella feels Nick Felino did. I think Alex Ovechkin has grown into that role. Was he ready for that when he got it? I don't think so. I, I think there were, you know, he was the highest paid player and he was the best player and they gave it to him. I mean, we've seen that happen how many times where the best player gets it. It's not always about the best player. It's about the best leader. It's about the best uh, organizer to an extent. So that's why the captain's role is so important because you have so much going on over here before you even get out there and play. Okay. So I hope that cleared it up, Greg. And no, you don't have a captain in beer league because I mean, what, what would you do? I mean, who wants to take that on? Like what kind of responsibility is there? We're going to play and then we're going to go for beers here. Okay. Not such a tough job there. Right. As you said, you don't have a coach, so you don't need a captain to go to the coach. Just do what you want. And if somebody is doing something stupid or not playing hard, I'm sure you police that yourselves. So you don't need a captain. It's not that important. National Hockey League, it's important. A lot of stuff going on, right? A lot of off-ice distractions for everybody. A lot of young guys going through growing pains that you went through that you can help them with. A lot of responsibility. And that's why it, it takes a unique individual to fill that role. So I hope that I've cleared all of that up for you, Greg. And I hope that on this very day, I'm your de facto captain. That's what I hope. <laughs> so I said the Blue Jackets have two days left of training camp, and then it will be on to Nashville to play against the Predators. So looking forward to calling my first game off the TV screen of the year. That is sarcasm. In case you didn't pick it out, that is sarcasm. All right? But it is the world in which we are right now. I do not want to say it is the world in which we live in. I would say it's the world in which I hope we are temporarily living in, but whatever the case. Uh, two games in Nashville, two games in Detroit, and then coming home for the home opener. 20th anniversary season. This will never be forgotten, by the way. A season like no other, with all the weirdness of it. It's already a shortened season. No fans at the beginning of the season. Some places will have them. Some places won't. Um, just craziness. But, but we're going to play. We're going to play NHL hockey. Oh, why did I do that? Why I complain about that all the time. Why do I complain about it? Because NHL stands for National Hockey League. So I just said National Hockey League hockey. Stupid. Stupid. 
another thing. I, I hate when I do things that I complain about, but I just did it. And I'll, I'm man enough to tell you. All right. Anyway, there is going to be an NHL season. Yes, I fixed it. There is going to be an NHL season and there will be ups and downs and bumps and bruises all along the way, but we're going to have it. And it's getting underway on Thursday. I will soon be going back to my uh, two day a week set. That's what I plan on doing. Uh, I plan on doing the Monday, Friday. I can tell you this. I am going to, I don't know. Friday might not come out early in the day because I have a guest that can do an interview Friday morning. And I would like to get him on because he's a, he's a guy that he covers. You know how the, the saying goes, kill two birds with one stone. Okay. Um, this guy does that because I have my own little personal feature, the 20 under 20, like 20 players that played under 20 games for this franchise in its existence. This guy fits that bill. Oh, but by the way, he also is an analyst for NBC Sportsnet and NBC, the mothership. Brian Boucher, former goalie. And I want to talk to him about goaltending early in the season because I think it's going to be uh, a really important position for everybody. And I think it's going to be a really big challenge for the goalies with the lack of a preseason and all that. So uh, Brian Boucher is going to join me on Friday. I'll put that out for you sometime on Friday after I have that conversation with him. And you can look forward to that coming up in just a couple of days. All right, let's see. Uh, I have pre-promoted that. Uh, the Inside Edge with Jody Shelley and I is going to be Tuesday this week. That's tomorrow. Uh, Tuesday, we'll soon settle back into our normal Wednesday schedule. But uh, this week, it is Tuesday because that's the day available to us. And we're going to take it and we're going to run with it. And it looks like at the time that I am talking to you about this, it looks as though we will have Oliver Bjorkstrand as our guest talking about the new contract that he just signed. That is subject to change. And I just say that because if it doesn't happen, then you can't say, you told me, you told me, you lied to me. I'm not lying to you. As I'm telling you right now, that's the plan. Oh, but plans do change, as I said. Anyway, we'll get it done one way or the other. We'll have a show for you Tuesday night, uh, 7 o'clock, flagship station of the Blue Jackets Radio Network, 97.1. The Fan in Columbus, also on the Blue Jackets app. Go to the Listen Live feature, or you can find it at bluejackets.com. Inside Edge on Tuesday, uh, first game of the season on Thursday, CBJ and 30 podcast on Friday with former goaltender Brian Boucher, former goaltender and NBC analyst. He's an A-list guest. That's how we say it in the business. A-list, B-list. After B-list, don't bother. Okay? It's not really C-list. If you're on the C-list, might as well be the S list, the suck list. Okay. I don't do that here. We're not doing that. We're not, we're not dropping below B and, and I'll take an occasional B. Usually they're by accident or I think they're going to be an A and they turn out to be a B. All right. I'm going a list, Brian Boucher later in the week. I guess I should say that's pending. I mean, we've, we've got a verbal agreement. Something could change. All right. Protect myself there too. It's what it's all about. All right. I've talked enough today. Thanks for your questions. Anytime. Twitter at Bobby Mac Sports. Email Bobby Mac at bluejackets.com. Send more voice recordings and more videos. I mean, no offense, but what's wrong with you? You get to be on the show. What are you shy? What are you afraid? Like, I got to talk to myself for 30 minutes every time I do this. I got to talk to myself for three hours every game I do. But you can't do it for 20 seconds. You can do it. I know you can. I know you can. And that's why I'm challenging you to do just that. Hey, thanks for listening today. It is appreciated as always. Get ready for a big week. The 20th anniversary season starts this week. That's going to do it for this edition of CBJ and 30 presented by Telhio Credit Union. Until next time, I'm Bob McElligot saying so long. 